recording artist, and he leads worship all around the world. Uh, he's a Messianic Jewish worship leader, and I want to tell you, we have had such a time. Friday evening with our friends from Messiah's house, we had a packed out house, an overflow crowd. Uh, last night with our Spanish service, uh, I thought he was only supposed to do like 20 minutes, and I think we finished at like quarter to 10. And, uh, you know, we just, I, I think we did structural damage to the building. We're gonna have to yes. get some engineers out here this week. But I wanna ask you to stand to your feet, and I wanna invite you. Some of Paul's songs might be new to you. I think many of them you'll know, but I really wanna invite you to get your praise on. If you like to worship the Lord and dance, feel free, feel at liberty to come and dance. If you wanna wave a banner and make a wave offering to the Lord this morning, I want you to give your very best welcome for our friend, Paul Wilbur. Praise the Lord. Come on, Brandon. Here we go. Let God arise, and he will scatter our enemies. We'll do so much structural damage, you're going to need a new sanctuary. Come on. Let God arise. Praise the Lord. Aren't you so glad that he sent Paul Wilbur to worship with us? this morning where the spirit of the lord is there is liberty there is freedom thank god welcome everybody and we're so glad uh, that you're here to worship with us paul wilbur is going to come back at the end of our service and he's going to play for us one more time but uh, we're going to go ahead and god bless you if you have your bibles turn with me today to the book of first thessalonians chapter five first thessalonians chapter 5. It's a little book buried in the middle of your New Testament. Uh, just flip around in the middle till you find it. If you find Hebrews, go left. If you find Romans, go right and turn a few pages and you'll come to 1 Thessalonians. Go all the way to the end of the letter uh, to chapter 5, to the last section of chapter 5. And we're going to talk about in the Father's family, in the Father's family today. While you're finding your way to 1 Thessalonians 5, just want to remind you that the annual report is coming up on Wednesday evening, March 12th. Once a year, our board of deacons and trustees and our pastors present to the congregation all the financial statements for the previous year and a report of what God has done. And if you're a member of Harvest Time Church, we especially want you to be at the annual report. And if you're part of our family, we welcome you to come. We're gonna be selecting three new members of our board of deacons and trustees on that evening. And so we hope you'll make plans to be with us. First Thessalonians. 5 look with me at verse 12 in the father's family now we ask you brothers to respect those who work hard among you who are over you in the Lord and who admonish you hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work live in peace with each other and we urge you brothers warn those who are idle encourage the timid help the weak be patient with everyone Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always try to be good to each other and to everyone else. Be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not put out the Spirit's fire. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Test everything, hold on to the good, avoid every kind of evil. And may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Let's pray. Father, thanks for this time together in your presence. I pray that you'd open our hearts, Lord, and give us the ability to receive your word. Open our spiritual eyes to see, our ears to hear, our minds to grasp, Lord, and our will to consent to the word of God. Speak life to us now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Gentile believers, what we don't learn from our Jewish brothers and sisters could cost us. One very windy day, a rabbi was on his way to temple. And suddenly a strong wind blew the hat right off of his head. The rabbi ran after his hat, but the wind kept blowing it further and further, and he couldn't catch up to it. A young Gentile man saw what happened, and being younger and faster, he ran after the hat, and he retrieved it. And he brought it back to the rabbi, and the rabbi was so grateful and so thankful that he gave the young man $20, and he put his hand on his head, and he blessed him. 
The young man was very excited about this good luck, and so he decided to take the $20 to the racetrack and see what would happen. He bet the 20 on the next race. After the races, he rushed home to tell his father about his very unusual day. He said, Dad, I arrived at the fifth race, and I looked at the program, and I saw that there was a horse named Top Hat. The odds on the horse were 100 to 1. It was the longest shot in the field, but after saving the rabbi's hat and receiving the $20 and the blessing, I thought this had to be a message from God, so I bet the 20 on Top Hat. And an amazing thing happened. He came in first by five lengths. His father said, you must have made a fortune. He said, yes, $2,000, but it gets better. In the next race, I saw a horse named Stetson. The odds were 30 to 1, and Stetson being a hat, and I thought about the rabbi's hat and his blessing, I decided to bet everything on him. The father was excited now. He said, what happened? The son said, Stetson came in like a rocket. I won $60,000. His father jumped out of his chair. He said, do you mean to tell me that you brought home $60,000? No, said the son. I lost it all on the next race. There was a horse named Chateau. And I decided to bet all my money on him because he was the heavy favorite. And Chateau means hat in French. I couldn't believe it when he broke down and came in dead last. The father put his hands on his head. He said, no, no, no. Hat in French is chapeau, not chateau. <laughs> you lost all of your money because of your ignorance. After he calmed down, he said to his son, tell me, what was the name of the horse that won? Oh, said the son, it was some long shot from Japan named Yamaka. If we don't learn from our Jewish brothers and sisters, it could cost us. A few weeks ago, we opened Paul's very first letter addressed to the new Christians in the Greek city of Thessalonica. We've been reading the lines of this letter, listening to what the Holy Spirit wants to say to us. You see, the letters of the New Testament are not just ordinary letters. They are letters from heaven. They're inspired by the Holy Spirit to speak to believers in every generation, everywhere. In the final lines of 1 Thessalonians, Paul teaches us what it really means to be a congregation. One of the most beloved evangelical scholars, Leon Morris, points out that every one of the New Testament churches was modeled after the Jewish synagogue. In fact, James even uses the word synagogue to describe believers' gatherings. But how to do synagogue was something that the new Greek believers had to learn. Luke tells us that many of them had been God-fearing Greeks, Gentiles who were deeply interested in Judaism, but they were reluctant to become full-fledged converts, mostly because of circumcision and the kosher rules. But when these God-fearing Greeks heard the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, they became eager Christ followers. Many of them had only participated in Jewish worship from the sidelines. Now they were full-fledged members of God's family, but they had to learn how to be members of that family. Looking at Paul's words, I see a few things that Gentile believers need to learn from our Jewish brothers and sisters and our Jewish roots. The first thing I see is that we need to learn how to be a covenant family. We need to learn how to be a covenant family. Throughout this entire letter, Paul uses family language. He addresses the believers as brothers and sisters. He calls himself a father. His frame of reference is distinctively Jewish. God's model for his covenant community has always been a family. When God called Abraham, God said, I will bless your family. I will make your family great. And I will make your family to be a blessing to all the other families of the earth. All throughout Israel's history, their identity was rooted in their sense of family. Sons and daughters of Abraham, children of Israel. God said he himself was their father. 
Jesus said that his followers were his family, his mother and brothers and sisters. The New Testament believers in Jesus, the New Testament churches, didn't consider themselves to be an institution. They didn't consider themselves to be an organization. They considered themselves to be a family. What can we learn from our Jewish roots about being a covenant family? For one thing, in God's family, leaders are fathers. Paul said, now we ask you, brothers, respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord, and who admonish you. I remember my dear friend, Pastor Jackson Sinyanga, sharing with me one day about the greatest need of the church in Uganda. Pastor Jackson plants hundreds of churches every year, but they don't have enough quality leaders to shepherd those churches. He said to me, Glenn, we desperately need help teaching our leaders because the only model of leadership they've ever had is bad leadership. Self-serving politicians and corrupt government. He said, we desperately need help teaching servant leadership. That was precisely the need in Thessalonica. As Paul traveled through the Gentile world, he planted churches and he immediately appointed elders in every one of those churches after the model of the Jewish synagogue. But the new Gentile believers had to learn a whole different approach to leadership than what they were accustomed to. They were accustomed to itinerant philosophers who went around teaching and looking for applause and wine and women and money. Paul's haters in Thessalonica accused him of being one of these, and he vigorously denied that charge. The Gentiles were also accustomed to corrupt politicians, greedy, cutthroat power brokers who worked through a system of bribes and favors and paybacks. But let me get back to the first century. Paul himself was held in prison for two years by the Roman governor Felix because Felix was hoping for a bribe. But you know, Jesus was completely different from those philosophers and those crooked politicians. And Jesus said in God's family, we must be different too. He said, you know, the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their high officials exercise authority over them, but not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant just as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. We learn from our Jewish roots that in God's covenant family, leaders are fathers, not lords. Paul said to the Thessalonians as apostles of Christ, we could have been a burden to you, but we were gentle among you like a mother caring for her own little children. We dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, urging you to live lives of worthy of God. You see, in God's covenant, family leaders are not cold, distant dignitaries in ivory towers, but they are intimately involved fathers. What can we learn from our Jewish roots about being a covenant family? Leaders are fathers. And another thing I see is that in God's family, fathers are honored. Paul said, respect those who work hard among you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. In their world filled with philosophers and crooked politicians, the Gentiles were very cynical. They were distrusting. They had a very low regard for leaders. Leaders were only out to help themselves, to line their pockets, to extend their power. Can I tell you that we suffer from the same low opinions of leadership today? I was in Kenya bartering for trinkets in a market, and I came across these little handmade postcards that had pen and ink drawings of African animals, and they were really cool. And so I picked out a couple I liked, a giraffe, an elephant, a lion. But in Kenya, you are never allowed to just browse by yourself. The shopkeeper was right there all over me like white on rice. And he saw that I was interested in the postcards, so he started showing me all of the postcards, a wildebeest, a hippopotamus, a zebra, a leopard. And then he held up one that had a picture of a bunch of monkeys in a tree. And he said, members of parliament without skipping a beat. <laughs> and I laughed so hard that I bought the whole lot of postcards. <laughs> Seems like 
dislike for bad leaders is a problem everywhere in the world and in every generation. By the way, I just want you to know that the technical zoological term for a group of baboons is a congress, all right? I'm not saying, I'm just saying. That's the correct term, a congress of baboons. <laughs> to him who has ears to hear, let him hear. <laughs> but in the family of God, Paul calls us to an attitude about leadership that's completely countercultural. Respect and hold in the highest regard in love, even if you have been admonished. What can we learn from our Jewish Brothers and sisters, about being a covenant family, leaders are fathers, fathers are respected. Another thing I find is that in God's family, brothers and sisters care for each other faithfully. Throughout this letter, Paul keeps encouraging the new believers, you've had a good start, but love one another more and more. He prayed that God would help them to love one another more and more. And now in these final lines of the letter, he shows us what that love looks like. Live in peace with one another. And we urge you, brothers, warn those who are idle. Encourage the timid. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. See, it's not just father leaders who care for God's family. Brothers and sisters in God's family care for one another. And Paul tells us what the care looks like. Warn the idle. That word warn is the same word for admonish that fathers do that he just used. And that word idle is actually an unfortunate translation. The word really means the disorderly, the disruptive, the unruly. You see, every family has problem children. And Paul says that the hard work of guiding and correcting and steering and disciplining those children doesn't fall on the shoulders of leaders alone, but on the whole family. The entire body is responsible to pray for and to advise and to guide and to try and help and encourage a brother or sister who's out of order or going astray. You are your brother's keeper. If a father has warned someone who's unruly and that person goes looking for sympathy in the family, brothers and sisters need to add their voices to the leader's voice. And say, no, you really do need to change your attitude. You really do need to change your course. Paul says, encourage the faint-hearted and help the weak. Hold on tightly, that word means, to those who are in danger of letting go of their faith. That word help literally means to use the strength of your body to brace someone up who is teetering and might fall over. Use your strength in the Lord to hold a brother or sister up who's at risk of falling into sin or falling away from the family or falling away from God. And then Paul says, be patient. No wonder he added those words because the people that we're trying to help don't always respond to our help the way that we think they ought. They don't always appreciate our efforts. They don't always heal like we think they should or grow as fast as we think they should. Beloved, listen to me. Before the gospel of Jesus Christ spread through the entire Gentile world to care for one another, like Paul is describing here, was something that was uniquely Jewish. Jesus told a story about a son who took his inheritance early and went to a far country. And he blew his entire fortune on wine, women, and song. And after his fortune was all gone, he found himself starving to death in the bottom of a pig pen. But it, Jesus said no one would give him anything to eat. The reason why is because he had moved to a Gentile country. And the basic kindness and dignity and care for people that was part of his Jewish heritage was completely foreign in that Gentile land. In fact, the Greeks believed that the most merciful thing that you could do for a suffering man was to let him suffer. Do you know many of the world's major religions like Buddhism and Hinduism teach that very same thing. But the prodigal son remembered in the bottom of the pig pen that in his father's house, even the servants were treated with dignity. They were treated with kindness and generosity. They had plenty to eat. And he came to his senses and he said, I will arise and I will go home to my father. 
What do our Jewish roots teach us about God's family? Another thing I find is that in God's family, there is forgiveness. Paul said, make sure nobody repays wrong for wrong, but pursue goodness toward e towards each other. See, we're able to forgive one another because the Father has forgiven us. Yeah. On his way home, the prodigal son rehearsed his apology speech to his father. Do you ever do that? You have to go face the music and you rehearse ahead of time what you're going to say. But when his father spotted him on the horizon, he never even had time to finish his speech because the father came and threw his arms around him and embraced him and forgave him everything. Jesus said that's a picture of how our father forgives us when we come home to him in humility. And if our father can forgive us the sum total of every sin that we have ever committed against him, then how can we not forgive one another for the transgressions between us? What we learn from our Jewish brothers and sisters is that dignity and faithful care and generosity and forgiveness, it is the culture of God's covenant family. What Gentile Christians need to learn from our Jewish roots. How to be a covenant family. And second, how to be keepers of the flame. How to be keepers of the flame. Paul says here, do not put out the Spirit's fire. For 2,000 years, the Jewish people exclusively were keepers of the flame. They had the fire of God's living presence with them. God appeared to Abraham in the form of a blazing torch, and he cut a covenant with Abraham. God spoke to Moses out of a burning bush that wasn't consumed by the fire. Later, God spoke to Moses on top of a mountain out of a fiery cloud. God stood in the middle of the camp of Israel for 40 years in a pillar of fire. During his earthly ministry, Jesus, Yeshua, revealed that he was that pillar of fire. Fire from heaven burned in the censers in the temple. That heavenly fire burned on the brass altar of sacrifice in the outer court. It burned on the lampstand and the altar of incense in the holy place. God's fiery presence sat enthroned between the wings of the cherubim on top of the Ark of the Covenant and the Holy of Holies. Fire from heaven consumed Gideon's sacrifice. Fire from heaven consumed Elijah's sacrifice. Fire from heaven consumed David's sacrifice on the threshing floor of Aruna. Fire from heaven consumed Solomon's sacrifice at the dedication of the temple. And it was the job of the priests to ensure that that fire from heaven never went out. It was their job to tend the fire, to feed the fire, to fan the fire, to guard the fire. When Jesus came, he widened the circle of flame keepers. After his sacrificial death on the cross and his resurrection on the third day and his ascension to heaven, 120 of his Jewish followers were gathered in the upper room and fire from heaven fell on them. And it rested on each one of them and the Holy Spirit of God entered into them and they became keepers of the flame. Later, those same Jewish believers were shocked when they preached Yeshua, the Savior, to the Samaritans and the Gentiles. And that same fire from heaven, that same Holy Spirit came and it filled them. So now we are the keepers of the flame, Jewish and Gentile believers in Yeshua together in God's family. That flame of God's living presence dwells inside of each one of us. And when we're gathered together, that flame of God's presence, it dwells in our midst. It was here this morning while we were worshiping the Lord. It's here right now with us. And it's our job to make sure that that fire doesn't go out. It's our job to feed the fire and fan the fire and to guard the fire. Have you heard about the Sunday assembly? It's an atheist church that was started by two British comedians and it is spreading like wildfire all across the country right now. They call it the best bits of church with no religion and pop tunes. 
They want everything that the church has to offer. They have uplifting singing. They sing songs like Lean On Me and Here Comes the Sun. They have sermons full of inspirational stories and poems. They believe in being a caring community and doing good works, but they don't want to be bothered about God. One opened in Los Angeles just a few weeks ago, and there were 400 people on the first Sunday, and it's grown to several thousand in just a month or two. Maybe the Sunday assembly is actually a helpful wake-up call for us. You see, being uplifting, being inspiring, being encouraging, those are all wonderful and good and necessary things, but there is a deeper purpose to our gatherings. And that is to experience the fire from heaven. It's to be filled to overflowing with the Holy Ghost and with power. It's to keep alive the flame of God's living presence in our midst. Can I tell you, there is a huge difference between being uplifted and lifting him up. There's a huge difference between human inspiration and Holy Spirit inspiration. There's a huge difference between human encouragement and holy encouragement from the Holy Ghost. I've been to concerts and they were fun. I've listened to comedians and they were funny. I've been to events and I've enjoyed meeting people and making connections, but I can tell you none of those things can ever, ever hold a candle to being where the flame of God's living presence is burning bright. Could you be happy in a church like the Sunday Assembly? So long as the music is rocking, so long as the sermons are humorous and positive and short, so long as people are friendly, what does it matter whether the flame of God's living presence is really there? Would you, would you even notice the difference? Samson had the living flame of the Holy Spirit with him, but he was so careless with his life that the flame went out and the Bible says he didn't even notice that it was gone. Eli, the priest, was charged with keeping the flame in the tabernacle, but he was undisciplined. He grew old and careless, and he let the flame go out, and the glory of God left Israel. David experienced fire from heaven while he was worshiping, but he became careless with his life, and he put in serious jeopardy the flame of God's presence with him in his great prayer, his famous prayer of repentance. He begged God, please, God, don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. Yes. Beloved, the church is a wonderful covenant family, but the basis of our community is the flame of his living presence inside of us individually and in the midst of us corporately. And without that, we are nothing. I had to repent because I lost my sanctification on Friday morning over the cold. I came out into my driveway Friday morning. Sasha, I couldn't take it anymore. I just, I, I, it pushed me over the edge. It was so cold that I stood in my driveway and I said, this cold is evil. It is pure evil. It is from the pit of hell, this cold. <laughs> We've been burning our fireplace a lot to help out because nothing really takes the, the cold out of the air like a nice wood fire. But you know, no matter how hot and how blazing our fire is, if we don't keep feeding it wood, it very quickly dies down. And then we have to feed it and we have to fan the embers and we have to get that flame going back again. The same thing is true with the flame of God's presence. Listen, it's not that we have to feed the Holy Spirit, but we have to feed our spirit in order to keep his living flame alive inside of us. And very quickly, Paul gives us three ways here that together we keep that fire, that flame alive, rejoicing always, praying continually, and giving thanks in the midst of everything. For years, I always understood these as individual instructions. But when I looked again, I realized that these are three things that we are supposed to do together. And it makes perfect sense because, you know, we couldn't really do these all alone, at least not all the time. To rejoice always means that no matter what, I keep my hope plant, uh, uh, planted firmly in Jesus and his promises. 
To pray continually doesn't mean that I never get up off my knees, but it means that all throughout the day I'm in constant contact with Him. I'm constantly breathing prayers to Him. Giving thanks is not for everything. It is in the midst of everything. Even so, I am not always in the place that I can do that, and neither are you. Sometimes we're overwhelmed by life. Sometimes we're overtaken by the enemy. Sometimes we're overcome with grief, and I really don't feel like rejoicing. I really can't find anything to give thanks for. I can't even pray sometimes, but thank God when I can't, someone else can. Sometimes, personally, you can't, but your covenant family can. And when you gather together with them, and they're rejoicing, and they're praying, and they're giving thanks to God, it buoys your spirit, it lifts up your spirit, it carries you, and it fans the flame of God's living presence inside of you. Paul ups the ante when he says, this is God's will for you. Gathering together with God's family for congregational worship, rejoicing and praying and giving thanks in the midst of everything, even when you don't feel like it, it keeps the flame of his presence alive. What Gentile Christians need to learn from our Jewish brothers and sisters, how to be a covenant family, how to be keepers of the flame. Another thing I see is how to covet the gift of prophecy. Paul says, do not put out the Spirit's fire and do not treat prophecies with contempt. The Jewish people not only had fire from heaven, but they had God's living voice in their midst. God spoke to the patriarchs, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He spoke to the leaders, Moses, Joshua, Gideon, Deborah. God spoke through dreams. He spoke through visions. He spoke through the prophets. He spoke through the Urim and the Thummim, and the people honored his word. They stepped out courageously in faith, trusting his word. They clung tenaciously to his word in patient hope. But God promised that a day was coming when prophecy would blossom among his family. One day the Holy Spirit fell and two elders in the camp of Israel, Eldad and Medad, began prophesying. Joshua was jealous for Moses' sake. He told Moses, stop them from prophesying. But Moses said, no, 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 Joshua, you don't get it. I wish that all of God's people would prophesy and that God would put his spirit on every one of them. Joel prophesied in the last days. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. When the Holy Spirit fell on the day of Pentecost, not only did the Jewish believers in Yeshua receive fire from heaven, but they opened their mouths and they prophesied. And as the gospel spread through the world, the gift of the Holy Spirit and prophecy spread through the world as well. Paul said, you may all prophesy one by one, follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. What we learn from our Jewish brothers and sisters is that prophecy is precious. At times, prophecy involves foretelling the future, but more broadly, prophecy is foretelling the future. It's speaking the word of God under the anointing, under the unction of the Holy Spirit. And beloved, when you are under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, God's word in your mouth becomes as powerful on earth as God's word in God's mouth. That's good preaching right there. When you speak the word of God under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, it brings about supernatural results. Prophecy opens the hearts of unbelievers to Jesus. Jesus met a woman by a well one day. He began to talk to her about spiritual things under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And her heart opened up to him. She said, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. 
And she began asking spiritual questions. And then Jesus discerned her current situation in life through the operation of the Spirit called a word of knowledge. And when he shared that with her, she was flat out convinced. She left her water jar and she went running all over town telling everyone, Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah. Beloved, covet to prophesy because prophecy is God's solution for the deep darkness of these last days. Everybody look at me because we're almost done and Paul's coming back and you're going to be happy. But listen to this. Don't miss this. You listening? You ready? Paul said in the last days, listen to me. Receive God's word. In the last days, demonically ferocious times will come. People will be lovers of themselves, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, without natural family affection, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. I want to tell you something. We are there right now. If you ever read your Bible and you wondered what it was like to live in the last days, I want to tell you, welcome to the last days. If you want to know what they look like, just go read the headlines. Go look at your news feed. But God has an answer for the darkness of the last days. God said, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. You see, the word of God in my mouth and the word of God in your mouth under the anointing of the Holy Spirit is the only thing that's powerful enough to pierce this present darkness and to awaken men and women out of their stupor and to turn them to God. Let's learn from our Jewish brothers and sisters to honor prophecy and let's covet to prophesy. What Gentile believers need to learn from our Jewish brothers and sisters. Finally, this. I see something that Gentile and Jewish believers need to learn together. Something that we need to learn together. Pastor Nick, come and help me. And that is how to be new creations in Jesus Christ. Paul closes his letter to the Thessalonians with a prayer for all of us. May God himself... The God of peace sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless until the second coming of our Lord Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah. He is the one who calls you, and he will be faithful to do it. Listen to me. Everybody look. One second. Give me your attention for 30 seconds more, and we're done. All right. I'm lying. A minute or two. <laughs> Before Jesus... Nobody could experience what Paul prays for in this prayer. The law was perfect and beautiful because ultimately the law is a description of the righteousness of the God that we love. But the law only worked on the outside. The law was unable to make anybody holy through and through like Paul prays for here. The law was unable to purify spirit and soul and body like Paul prays for. The law atoned for sins, but it didn't transform the inner man. Only Yeshua, only Jesus fulfilled all the demands of the law. His beautiful life embodied all of the righteousness of God that is described in the scriptures. And his atoning sacrifice on the cross, his resurrection from the dead, it opened the way for a whole new experience for Jews and Gentiles alike. Through faith in Jesus, the law is no longer written on tablets of stone. The law is now written on our hearts so that we can grow more and more holy every day from the inside out. Holiness is something that all of us, Jewish and Gentile believers alike, must learn as we grow together in the beautiful grace of our Lord Jesus, Yeshua, Hamashiach.
Would you stand on your feet this morning and would you give Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, a great big praise in this house. Come on, let's give Jesus a great big praise. Oh, you can do better. Let's give Jesus a great big praise in this place. Hallelujah. Come, Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Come on, lift up your voice. Sing Jesus, Lamb of God. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Why don't you join hands with one another? Let me just speak this blessing over you as, as you go today to carry the flame out of here. Listen, a flame is no good in a house of light. It's got to get out and chase the darkness. Amen. We, we need to be darkness chasers. If there was ever a need, Look, you just look over the hill and there's Manhattan right, right below you. You look to the north and there's my hometown of Boston where flames used to be burning brightly and, and it's cold up there. Aye, aye, aye. They call them the frozen chosen in the northeast. But I believe God has done something very unique here this weekend. Um, even, even the structure was begging for mercy last night as we shouted the praises of God in this place. But it's one thing to do it in here where it's comfortable and convenient. But what about at lunchtime today and dinner time tonight and with your family this week and where you work and where you go to school and that's where it really counts. People need to see a flame burning bright. Who knows, who knows how many and what lives you'll impact this week as you carry the warmth and the flame and the power of God from this place out into a, a desperate world, a desperate world. In Numbers chapter six, the Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron and he said, when you bless my people, declare these words. And the Lord said, when you do this, I will do two things. I will place my name upon the people. And he said, I, Jehovah, I will bless them. Amen. And so I want you to add faith to these words today, that, that as I declare these words as an, as an ancestor from, uh, from our people and from Moses and Aaron, that when these words are declared over you, that you will see the name of God inscribed upon your life today. His treasured possession. People are worried in the last days about the mark of the beast. Listen, when he places his name on you, there's no room for any other name. And when he blesses you, there's no room for the curse. A curse without a place cannot light without a cause. And so receive the name of the Lord and the blessing of the Lord over your life today. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. Yivarechacha Adonai v'yishmarecha. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Ya'er Adonai panevelecha v'chunecha. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Yisa Adonai panevelecha v'yasem lecha shalom. B'shem Yeshua HaMashiach sar shalom in the name of Yeshua, Jesus, our Messiah, who is the Prince of all peace. Amen and amen and amen. Give the Lord a good shout of praise. God bless you. Have a great week. Carry the flame boldly. God bless you.